Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we ended the last lecture with uh, a couple of quick discussion on polarization. I just want to mention a couple of things before moving on to my uh, uh, lecture right now. So something that uh, we should know is that we have something called polarization vector. And this polarization vector essentially shows the direction of the uh, shows the type of polarization and also the direction of the uh, electric fields. For example, imagine this antenna and this antenna here, which is a horn antenna, is in fact linearly polarized. And if you think of electric field, this is the electric field right now. So this is your electric field of this horn antenna toward this direction. So if I'm assuming, for example, this is y hat direction. If I want to write the polarization vector of this antenna in this direction, I could just write y hat. Now, for the same antenna, if I rotate it 90 degree, if, remember, this was the electric field. And you're going to learn later on why this is the electric field. But for now, just accept it from me. If I now rotate it 90 degree, of course, this is now the electric field. So now it could be, for example, x hat. So as you expect, you have only one component for this linearly polarized. But you could also do something else. For example, if this is the electric field, you can rotate it a little bit, 45 degrees, for example. Now, it is a still linearly polarized, but it's, it's going to do something like that for you. So this is going to be now x hat plus y hat. But remember, this polarization now, it has both x hat and y hat, of course. But remember, we define polarization vector to be a unity vector. So the magnitude of this should be 1. But right now, if you take the magnitude, is 1 squared plus 1 squared, so 2, and then a square root of 2. Therefore, uh, it's not a unit vector. So what you do is you're going to have this, for example, here. And in this case, if you look, get the magnitude, magnitude of this vector is 1 divided by a square root of 2 to the power of 2 plus 1 divided by a square root of 2 to the power of 2, it's half, 1. So this is a unit vector. So in, in the general case, I could, for example, if this is my, uh, if I, if I, if this is my horn antenna, I can rotate it by an arbitrary angle, and it's still I get linearly polarized because originally this was linearly polarized. So essentially, I could write the polarization vector as cos theta, for example, x hat plus sine theta y hat. So in this particular example, theta is 90. In this particular example, theta is uh, 0 and so on. I mean, maybe theta is not the best one here to use because we may confuse it with theta of a spherical coordinate. So maybe I just write it cos alpha and sine alpha. And in this case, alpha was 45 degrees. So this is the polarization vector for, uh, for a, a linearly polarized antenna. Now, if we go, for example, to circularly polarized antenna. This is an example of a circularly polarized antenna. You're going to see that in the videos related to lab. So this one, as you remember, for circularly polarized, we need both components uh, of electric field. So if, if it's not going to be like linearly polarized that you have this one, you have to have this one and it's the perpendicular component because it's going to rotate like that. So if it's going to rotate like a circle, you need this component and this component as well. So essentially, you get x hat and also you're going to get y hat. Now, again, similar to the story here, if I write that, it's not going to be a unit vector. So I'm going to divide by a square root of 2 to make it a unit vector. But if I keep it like that, this is the same as linearly polarized, which was doing this. But here it's going to rotate. And what we've discussed earlier, to, to have that, we need to have 90 degree phase difference between the x and y component, between the two perpendicular components. And that's why we're going to have a j here. Remember, j 
is equal to e to the power of j 90 degrees. And you can use Euler equation to write that as cos 90 plus j sine 90. This is 0 plus j 1. So it's equal to j. So you see, when you have a j, that's 90 degree phase difference. So that's why I put j here. So, so and j could be plus or minus depending on right hand or left hand circularly polarized. Again, we're going to extensively discuss that in a different video related to lab. So this would be the polarization vector for our circularly polarized. So this is... Uh, this is a, a, a polarization vector for that. And of course, if something is not this or that, that then you have your elliptical polarization. Now, the, the advantage of this polarization vector is that I can define something as polarization loss factor. And this polarization loss factor is actually show, show me how much power is lost between the two antennas because of polarization mismatch. So I can write it as, for example, rho one hat or rho transmit hat dotted with rho receive hat to the power of two. So, so if, you, if you look at that, this rho hat transmit, rho hat receive, this is for the polarization vector of the transmit antenna. This is for the polarization vector of the receive antenna, you dot product them, you square it, and you get your polarization loss vector. For example, let me make, a, make you an example. Let, let me assume that I have these two antennas like this. So these are both linearly polarized, so they're radiating like that. Imagine this direction is, for example, y hat. Now, if I, if I put them like this, the polarization of this antenna, the rho hat of this antenna is y hat, and the polarization of this antenna is also y hat. So they, they're located like that. So both of them expecting y hat. So if I calculate the polarization loss factor for this configuration, what I'm going to have would be y hat dotted with y hat to the power of two. And you know that if you dot product two identical vector, you got one, so this is one. So this essentially means you're not gonna have any loss due to polarization mismatch because essentially it's polarization match. Now, if you do, if you keep one of them like this, so if you keep one of them like this, so this would be y hat for this one, so I'm just going to keep repeating y hat. But then the other one, instead of keeping it identical, you're going to rotate it 90 degree. So this, this antenna was originally y hat. But when you rotate it 90 degree, now it becomes x hat. So, the, uh, so now this was the first case. Now you rotate it 90 degree. So in this case, this becomes x hat y hat dotted x hat to the power of two, this becomes zero. So that essentially means even if you do a perfect job in everything else, as soon as you have the polarization like this, theoretically you assume you get nothing. In the lab, you see that we, we, we have something called cross polarization, uh, which is going to be essentially reception in this case, which might not be... Uh, ideally zero. You could have some values, but that's uh, that's for the lab uh, to see. But here, theoretically, this would be essentially uh, zero reception or in practice, a very a small reception. So that's, that's, the, that's the problem essentially with linearly polarized antenna. But now let's assume that I'm going to change my problem. So I'm going to use this helical antenna and I have this one too. So this is now linearly polarized. This is circularly polarized. Now, when this is circularly polarized, this is linearly polarized. Let's see what's going to happen in general. So I'm assuming that I'm rotating this. It could be any direction. So let's assume I'm rotating it by alpha. So instead of writing the polarization of that as y hat or x hat, I'm going to write it as the most general form of this which is this one, 
which in this case, this antenna can have any orientation. And with this antenna, that would be the polarization. So essentially, I'm going to use these two to find the polarization loss factor. So let's do that and see what I'm going to get. Okay, so what I need to do, I need to dot product 1 divided by square root of 2x hat plus minus, it could be uh, right hand or left hand circularly polarized, dotted with this, which is cos alpha x hat plus sine alpha y hat to the power of 2. Now, if you dot product two vectors, uh, x component would be multiplied together. So I'm going to get one square root of two times cos alpha. So that would be x times x. And then y hat times y hat, I'm going to get plus minus j, one divided by a square root of two sine alpha. So I need to take magnitude of that. So it's a complex number. If you take the magnitude of a complex number, and this is magnitude a square, that would be real part a square plus imaginary part a square. So that's going to give me half of cos 2 alpha plus half of sine 2 alpha. So this is the real part. This is the imaginary part. So the real part is square, imaginary part is square. We know that cos square plus sine square is 1, so the final result is half. And this is a very impressive result. So that essentially means the meaning of this result, which is very important, is that if you rotate this antenna like that, if you rotate this antenna like that, in terms of polarization mismatch, there is no effect. You're always going to receive half of the popper. So half of the popper you're losing in this case. But you're always making sure that you receive half of the power. In the previous case, when you had linear to linear polarization, you may completely lose the signal. But here, you can make sure that it's always half independent of this alpha angle. So in situations that this might change, that would be a good design to have, for example, one of them circularly polarized, the other one linearly polarized, right? And that would be, for example, the case for uh, GPS antennas, GPS communication. So this is uh, this is something that's interesting, and you may want to represent a, a PLF by in dB. So remember, PLF is in uh, is a power. So you need to take the 10 log, and you can re realize it's power because these rho hat is the direction essentially with the electric field. So you essentially square it, so you end up with power. Remember, electric field is squared. So if you want to have it in dB, you take 10 log base 10 of half, and it becomes minus 3 dB. So that's your polarization loss factor in this case. Now, this is something interesting. And in fact, this observation that this angle uh, doesn't uh, appear here, it would be completely canceled. It's a method that people use to figure out if the antenna is circularly polarized or not. So from the measurement point of view, you can use this method to understand the polarization of an antenna. Imagine you have an antenna, you don't know its polarization. Now you need some measurement method to figure out what's the polarization. So if you have a linearly polarized antenna like this one, and if you have a probe that's measuring, if you start rotating one of them, if, uh, if, you, if you assume your, for example, the probe is linearly polarized too, then what's going to happen is that at some point you get maximum signal, at some point you get nothing. But if your antenna under test is circularly polarized and your probe is a linearly polarized probe, then as soon as you start rotating, for example, your uh, probe, then the receive signal would be almost constant. So this is the way that you can figure out the polarization of an antenna in measurement. OK, now that we have finished talking about polarization loss factor, let us talk about an important equation called Friis equation. 
So in Freeze equation, I'm assuming I have uh, one antenna here. I refer to this as transmit antenna TX. These are the, this is the port of this antenna. So when it comes to port, imagine if this is my antenna, then I have a port right here. That's the port of the antenna where I can feed the antenna from here. For example, this is a coaxial cable port. Here I'm showing it with two wires, but essentially uh, in most cases it's gonna be a coaxial cable port. So that's the port of the antenna and uh, I, I, I'm connecting a source to this. So, so this is, and the source provides the power PT. I have a check mark here. That means I know my PT, but how much uh, source is providing uh, power for me. Remember, this is not P radiated because it still needs to go through the antenna. And then on the other side, I have my receive antenna. And uh, this is the port of the receive antenna. And then it goes to a load ZL. And this is my unknown. P received is my unknown. So this equation connects this PT to PR. And it's very critical equation with only one limitation, which is not really limitation. You just need to be aware of that, that the distance between the two antennas, for example, from here to here, which let's call it R, this R needs to belong in the far field zone. So this is not for the near field. So R belongs to the far field zone. So R needs to be, uh, needs to satisfy the far field criteria. So this is uh, the only thing you need to be aware of really. After that, you can just use this, use this. So now let's start and try to understand how we can connect these two. And that would be our freeze equation. So let me start by saying that First, this PT needs to enter antenna. But then, if it wants to enter antenna, there is a reflection coefficient right here. And let's call this reflection coefficient gamma t. So there is a reflection coefficient. If it's zero, then it's fantastic. There is no reflection. The power is going to go through. But if there is gamma t here, gamma square will reflect back. Remember, gamma is the ratio of voltages. So gamma square would be power, voltage square. So gamma square will reflect back. So one minus gamma square will go in. So PT times gamma square would be reflection, but I don't want reflection, I want transmission. So one minus gamma T square is gonna go through. So now, now I'm here. So I've already entered the antenna with this amount of power. If gamma reflection is zero, I, the, the power that antenna accept is essentially PT. Now, this power is gonna go through the antenna and then it's gonna experience the loss of the antenna. So the antenna may have some loss. So to take into account the power that you have here, and that's gonna be some loss because of dielectric and metallic structure, you need to multiply that by the efficiency of the antenna, radiation efficiency of the antenna. That's going to take, uh, take into account the losses within the antenna structure. So now this power is now you, you can radiate it because you take into account the mismatch, you take into account the loss within the antenna. So this is now the power that's going to be radiated. Now, when the power is going to be radiated for a second, let's assume that the antenna is an isotropic antenna. Then what would be your power density? You have a total power. Isotropic antenna says let's distribute it isotropically on a sphere. So essentially, you have a spherical wave front. Everywhere on the spherical wave front, you have the same power density. So you essentially distribute this power on a spherical domain. So four pi r squared is the area of a sphere. So if you have an isotropic source like that, and I give you p power, then the density of the power, power density would be p divided by the area of this sphere, which is four pi r squared. So this is the same thing. I give you this much total power right after the aperture of the antenna, and now I tell you, okay, radiated isotropically. So you distributed equally 
over the surface of the sphere, which would be 4 pi r squared. So that's, this is assuming that the antenna is isotropic. But we know our antenna is not isotropic. Our antenna is, in fact, has a directivity because that's the whole point of antenna. An isotropic source does not exist. So to convert this power density to the power density of an actual antenna, you need to multiply it with the directivity of your antenna. And I'm going to show it with this subscript T to say, okay, this is my transmit. And because of doing that, maybe I should do the same thing for C, uh, CD, radiation efficiency. Maybe I should add a T here to say this is for the transmit, maybe with a comma, ECDT. So this is the directivity. If you multiply the directivity of this antenna with the power density of an isotro equivalent isotropic source, then you get the power density of this actual antenna. But you want to understand the power density as it relates to the receiving antenna. So directivity itself is a function of angle theta and phi. But which angle here? The angle that the transmit antenna sees the receive antenna. So I call it theta t and phi t. So theta t and phi t. This would be the directivity of the transmit antenna. So you essentially have your power density. You essentially have your directivity. And then you can, this essentially becomes power density of your uh, transmit antenna around the receiving antenna. Now let's check a couple of things here. Directivity is dimensionless because it's a ratio. This quantity here is power. You divide by R square. So remember that this quantity that we have here is still a power density, watt per meter square. So it essentially tells you that here in this area, I have watt, this much watt per meter square. So this is uh, what we have right now. Now, what, what's, what's important here is now we look at the receiving antenna and see how the receiving antenna can collect part of the power that exists in this power density. And the way that this antenna is going to collect the power is through its aperture. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But essentially, if you have watt per meter square and you want to understand how much watt you are going to receive, it is very uh, natural that you assume that this watt divided by meter square should be multiplied by meter square, which is the area, and then meter square, meter square cancel, and you get your watt. So essentially, at this point, we need to multiply that by effective area of the receiving antenna. And I call AE for the effective area, and this R is for the receiving antenna. So that would be that would be essentially the way that this antenna are going, is going to receive some power. So, but then what is effective area? I mean, how can we relate the effective area of a given antenna to the parameters that we already know? So just before doing that, let's repeat what we had here. This is watt per meter square power density around this antenna. Let's assume this antenna has an effective area. So with its effective area is going to collect some of this power density. Meter squared times watt per meter squared becomes watt. So now I have watt. This, the whole thing is watt. Now, regarding effective area, gain of an antenna is connected to effective area by this equation. So you see, you have gain and is related to effective area by 4 pi divided by lambda 2 times effective area. First of all, see that this makes sense in terms of dimension. Remember, lambda square is meter square. Effective area is an area, so it's meter square. So meter square divided by meter square 
is essentially you cancel the dimension and you end up with gain, which is also dimensionless because that's ratio. So, so this in terms of dimension makes sense. Now, if I want to look at it from a different point of view, I can write it as AE divided by lambda squared for pi. So that's another way of doing that. So AE divided by lambda squared divided by 4 pi. Now, why this form is interesting? Because as you can see the proof in the textbook, this is essentially the effective area of an isotropic source. So this is effective area for an isotropic source or isotropic antenna. So what does this equation tells you? Remember, gain was the comparison of radiation intensity between actual antenna and the isotropic antenna. Here, you're, you're using gain in a different way. You say comparison between the air effective area of the actual antenna with that of the isotropic antenna. So this equation uh, connects us, connects effective area to gain. Now, you might get a little bit confused that why I talk about effective area, why do I don't say just area or physical area. I, I'm going to explain that later in the course, but let me make you an example to understand it. If you look at, uh, if you look at, for example, the electric field that the aperture of this type of antenna generally expect, uh, for example, you at the aperture of this type of antenna, you, we usually have the, the antenna usually expect electric field in this form. This is what the antenna expects. So you see at the edge, the electric field that is expecting it goes to zero. And that you probably know that because you know that tangential to the metal electric field needs to be zero. So you might get a very a strong electric field here, but as you go to edges, this tangential field needs to be zero. So this is in the later part of the course, you're going to see that, uh, for example, antenna might expect an electric field like that. Now, imagine you are sending a plane wave to the antenna, and this plane wave that's coming to the antenna has electric field all the same because it's a huge uh, a spherical wave that we consider it as plane wave. And it's coming here. And here, the electric fields are all the same. So of course, the antenna, the, between what the antenna expects and the plane wave that's coming here, there is a difference. So the antenna cannot use its whole physical area to collect. And you can see it here, for example, if you, for example, look at the whole physical area, this is also part of the physical area. But the effective area of the antenna is essentially what the antenna expects. This is not very precise discussion, but I want to tell you that this is not a, you, a, this is the importance of effective area. For example, if you have an antenna that hypothetically can receive electric field like that, then in this case, you can get a physical area which is the same as effective area. So we're going to see this more later on in the course. So now, this was our gain connected to effective area. So I can just say, therefore, the effective area is lambda 2, 4 pi gain. So I can just substitute that over here. So I can just substitute this by lambda square, 4 pi gain. Which gain? Gain of the receiving antenna. And remember, there is a direction involved too, because gain has direction. So the direction that this is looking toward the transmit antenna, let's call it theta r phi r. So I'm going to have theta r phi r. So that's going to be my gain here. So now with this, 
I essentially have the watts that this antenna receive. And because here it's, it's also gain, I'm incorporating the loss within the antenna itself. But I might have also reflection coefficients similar to this gamma t on that, on that side too. Therefore, I'm going to get also 1 minus gamma. This time, let's call it gamma uh, maybe on the receive side, a square. So this was gamma on the transmit side, that's gamma on the receive side. So this essentially would be my P receive, except that I need to add something else or multiply something. And that's the effect of polarization loss factor, because if I do everything correctly here, but then I have polarization mismatch, it's essentially useless because then I'm not going to receive anything. So the whole thing multiplied by PLF. And if I do that, then this becomes my P received. Now let's redistribute that and see what would be the result. So I'm going to say PR divided by P transmit. So PR divided by P transmit would be equal to lambda 4 pi r the whole thing is square. So if I do that, I, I already taken into account this with this 4 pi with this. So that would be lambda 4 pi r square. So you could potentially combine these two together. You know that radiation efficiency times directivity is gain. So write that as gain transmit theta t phi t. So you have that, and then you have gain of receive, theta r phi r, and then you have your reflection coefficient, and then PLF. So that would be your freeze equation. Now, if you do a good job in design, Usually, reflection coefficients are small. So these would, reflection coefficient is a small, so you may ignore this. If the reflection coefficient is a small, you may ignore this. If you make sure that you have polarization match, this is close to one. You can ignore this. So these becomes the very important part of your, uh, of your equation, of your freeze equation. Now, What's very important here is that, first of all, as you see, the power drops by 1 divided by r square. So that's something very important. Power drops by 1 divided by r square. The other thing is that, remember, lambda is cf. So lambda is cf. So if you substitute CF for lambda here, then you're going to see that because F is going to go to the denominator and there is a square here, then you can see that power drop. So I can just say power drop with distance is 1 divided by R square and also is related to 1 divided by F square because if you substitute lambda CF. Now, this is very important. This tells you that if you go to very high frequency, then this factor is going to be more important. You're going to lose your signal faster. If you go to higher distance, you're going to lose your power faster, but with the coefficient of 1 divided by R square. So if you want to use, for example, a very high frequency, 100 gigahertz, so this is going to be very bad in terms of power drop, then you have to compensate that for very large gain. So you see, if you go to higher frequency, then you need larger gain. If you want to go to larger distance, you need larger gain to compensate for that, to get some PR that's detectable by on the receipt side. So this is the very important trade-off. Frequency increases or distance increases, power drops with these, uh, with these things. So if you, for example, work at 1 gigahertz, and now all of a sudden go to 10 gigahertz, if you keep everything the same, then because of this 1 divided by F2, the power that you're going to receive in this case would be 100 times as smaller than this case. 
because you have one divided by 10 to the power of two. This one is one divided one by one to the power of two. Therefore, if you go to this frequency, then you need to use a larger gain value to compensate for that. And the same thing for distance. So I hope that this is now clear for you. Okay, so uh, one thing that I want to emphasize here, and I feel that that's important, is that this term here, so this term, let me change my marker. So this term that we have here is called free space loss factor. So let me, let me write it. So they call it usually free space loss factor and it's lambda divided by 4 pi r squared and because most of the time we may talk about frequency you may substitute lambda by c divided by f so you have you have this as your free space loss factor now i want to i want you to pay attention to the term loss here, loss does not mean that air or free space is going to take the energy away from you, like, for example, like a resistance that it's going to turn into heat. The meaning of free space loss factor is that this is going to be reduced because th the same power is going to be distributed over larger sphere and larger sphere and larger sphere. So this is because of spherical spreading of the energy so it, it's very this is very easy to show so for example so for example assume that you have an antenna here you have an antenna here and this is going to radiate p now if if this is going to the wave is going to go as in a spherical a sp a spreading like this now the power density on this a smaller sphere, let's call this R1, it's going to be P divided by 4 pi R1 squared. Of course, times directivity, because that's not isotropic. But let's assume it's isotropic for the moment. And if you go to the larger sphere, it's of course going to be P divided by 4 pi R2 squared. So this is R2 now. Now, so you see the power density decreases. The power density decreases, and therefore, if you want to collect some power, for example, by an aperture, which is this side, this is the aperture of the antenna that you want to collect. If you are here or here, you're going to multiply the same effective area to the power density here and the same effective area to the power density here. So of course, this power density is a smaller. So when you multiply this by that, you get less power compared to the case that you multiply the same effective area by this power density. So this loss doesn't mean you lose your power. This essentially means this power density decreases because, because of the spherical spreading. And then you need to multiply effective area by the power density, so you get less power. So that's uh, so you need to be careful with this uh, uh, loss here and to understand it carefully. So this is because of a spherical spreading of the energy. Okay, so we talked about Friis equation. In Friis equation, we had a transmit and receive antenna. But within them, we, we just had the free space. But here we go to a different equation, radar range equation. And in radar range equation, this is for detection of a target. For example, imagine this is your transmitter, for example. This is your receiver. And this transmitter illuminates the target. And then the target reflects the energy or scatters the energy. And this antenna is going to receive the energy and then from this interaction, you want to figure out what the target is. So that's the fundamentals of uh, the uh, radar range equation. Similar to Friis equation, the distances R1 and R2 to the target needs to belong to the far field zone. So that's also 
the case here. Um, remember, because we're using gain, directivity, and things like that, and all of these are far field quantities. So, so this is uh, this is very important for uh, detection, and it has several applications. So it's good to know the equations for this case too. Now. Now, let's start again by, by assuming that the source is going to provide power T. So this is going to be power T. So this is going to be power T. But then you're going to have some reflection coefficient here. So when it goes, the power goes through the antenna, it's not going to be PT. It's going to be PT1 minus gamma T squared. So that's going to be the power add that is made it to the antenna then it's going to experience some loss within the antenna structure so it's going to be multiplied by cd which is the efficiency of the antenna which antenna transmit antenna now we are at the aperture of the antenna so we're going to free space so now i'm assuming that this antenna radiates isotropically so if it radiates isotropically it gets this power and distributed equally over the surface of a sphere. Because I'm considering the distance r1, I'm going to have 4 pi r1 squared. So remember, this is now watt per meter squared, assuming that it's isotropic. But I know my antenna is not isotropic, so I'm going to multiply it by its directivity, directivity of the transmit at the angle theta t phi t. So I'm assuming that this is the target with angle theta t and phi t, t for transmit. So remember, I don't need to multiply by gain because I'm already outside the antenna. So I've already taken into account the loss within the antenna, and it's actually here. So this times that is my gain. So this is going to be the power density. This is still the power density that's going to hit the target. Now, when the target is illuminated by this, then target is going to reflect back the power. Okay, so far we know that this is the power density of our, uh, the power density that's illuminating the target. So now target is going to scatter this power. And the, the way that uh, the scattering signature of the target is often defined is by its radar cross section. So this is a quantity that can be measured for different target. So radar cross section is in meter square, also defined, also known as echo area. So, so uh, and you, you may call it RCS, radar cross section. So this essentially uh, can be measured for different target. And the way that the definition works is that when you, are, when you are using this radar cross section sigma in the equation, you're going to assume that this is going to scatter the object, uh, the, the, the power isotropically. So now, so if this is the power density illuminating the target, the total power uh, scattered by the target would be this power density times sigma, meter squared. So meter squared times watt per meter squared would be watt. So let me write it down below so that we have more space. I'm just going to repeat what we have. So this would be my dt theta t phi t. And now I'm going to multiply by sigma. So this is now going to be watt. Now, this is going to, now what would be the power density? Remember I mentioned about isotropical scattering. So I'm, I'm going to have 4 pi r squared. Which r? Because I'm considering my receive antenna, I'm just going to write r2 because this is going to be the power density right here. So now, again, this is back to power density. Remember, when I multiply by sigma, it becomes watt. Then I divide it again by 4 pi r squared, the area of the sphere that's emanating from the target. So that would be 4 pi r2 squared. Now, this is power density, watt per meter squared. Now, this antenna needs to receive that. How does the antenna receive it? 
the antenna is going to receive it by its effective area. So the effective area of the receiving antenna. I want to remind you that we wrote gain is 4 pi lambda square effective area. So instead of effective area, I'm going to write it based on the gain of the receiving antenna. So I'm going to substitute the effective area by lambda 2 4 pi gain of the receiving antenna at the angle that it's looking. Let's call it theta r phi r. So now this is going to be the power, the total power here. And because it's gain, it's already taken into account the loss within the antenna, but you might have also some reflection. So then you're going to have the reflection on the receive side too, similar to the transmit side. And you might also have some polarization mismatch which is going to be in PLF. So now this is going to be essentially the power received. Now, if I rearrange this, let me see what's going to, what I'm going to get. So PR divided by PT is going to be equal to lambda. So I have my lambda square here. I have 4 pi R1, R2. So I'm going to go lambda, then 4 pi r1, r2 a square. So if I do that, I already taken into account this 4 pi, this 4 pi, this r1, this r2, and this lambda. But I am still missing 1 divided by 4 pi there. So I can perhaps just add it just before that. So PR PT is 1 divided by 4 pi that. Then I can combine these two as gain of the transmit in the appropriate direction. I'm going to drop the direction for now for simplicity. And this is going to be the gain of receive that I have. So I have that. Uh, then, of course, I have my radar cross section that's very critical so this is my radar cross section and then i have these uh, impedance mismatches one minus gamma square uh, here so i'm gonna have one minus gamma t square one minus gamma r square and then polarization loss factor so this is essentially becoming my radar equation now so something that you can immediately see here, something that you can immediately see here is that, again, because lambda is C divided by F, power drops by 1 divided by F square. So essentially, this is C divided by F. This is a square. So power drop by 1 divided by F square. So when you have high, you're using higher frequency, the received power could be less. So you need to compensate it with uh, more gain. So the antenna should be more directive. The other thing that you see that if the target is very small in terms of radar cross section, sigma can be very tiny. So if sigma is very tiny, the received power would be very tiny. So you may not be able to actually detect the target if sigma is so tiny. So again, to compensate for that, you need to have larger gain. The other thing that you might see here is that uh, in some system design, they use the same antenna for both transmit and receive. And those systems are called monostatic. So this system right now is bi-static. You have two of them, but it could be monostatic. So if it's monostatic, these two antennas would be on top of each other, essentially. They're the same antenna. So R1 becomes equal to R2 becomes R. And if that happens, then this term is becoming lambda 4 pi R times R, R1 times R2, if they are equal, becomes R2 and the whole thing is square. So if you compare that with the, uh, the same similar factor for freeze equation, then you, you realize that you have r to the power of 2 here, and then there is another 2 here, so the r is going to be r to the power of 4. And you can understand it somehow because if you have one antenna, so it goes illuminate and then comes back. 
So this is our uh, radar equation. It's good to, uh, to use textbook and give you some a couple of values for sigma so that you understand it. So I'm going to use the textbook to write a couple of sigma for you. For example, for example, let's see for pickup truck. This is the value of sigma. 200 meter square. So this is in fact 200 meter square. Sometimes you convert that to dB to get the value in dBs. Some people do that and to do it like that then you're going to go 10 log base 10 200 and that's going to become 23 dB. But to tell people that look this was the radar cross section in db radar cross section of, is of course in a meter a square so you're gonna have an sm here like a squared meter to say that this is uh, from sigma so when people say c23 db sm they know that you take the db from radar cross section so that's for example one thing here or for example for bird the value that the textbook gives is sigma equal 0 0.01 and that's going to be 10 log 0 0.01 which is 10 to the power of minus 2 that's going to become minus 20 db and we write it as dbsm so then for example we have insect and the insect that we have here is sigma equal point it has four zeros and then one so you change you you take it to to uh, db that's going to become minus 50 dbsm so now you can you can check this table in the textbook to see for different things but the thing is as sigma gets a smaller then uh, you need to be uh, adjusting your gain and things like that so that you can have some a received signal that's detectable. So that would be our radar equation, which is in the far field. And we had this equation too, and we were able to use these quantities, gains, and things like that in a um, effective way here. So remember the way that I did that, I had some power. I first assumed this is isotropic, so power was distributed equally. So I wrote P divided by four pi r squared. 4 pi r squared is the area of the sphere. And then I said, no, it's not isotropic, so I'm going to multiply it by the directivity of the antenna. So this is the way that we took advantage of the concept of directivity. Okay, thank you.